What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. A phrase my parents used to often say to me when I was a little boy. For instance, when my mom was trying a new dish for dinner, surprise casserole, she said, just try it. If it doesn't kill you, it'll make you stronger. Now, my mom is an excellent cook, so I usually had nothing to worry about, but when she offered me liver and onions, different story. Well, my dad, in the same way, when we would work on the plumbing at the house, and I had four sisters, so the bathroom drain would often stop up with their long hair. And we would go, and we would take apart the drain, and when the tub was full of water, and you take the drain off, and you get the hair clog out, who knows what happens? The water comes right down on you. And my dad would say, well, if it doesn't kill you, it'll make you stronger. Well, I doubt that my parents knew where this phrase came from. And I don't know if most of you guys know where it comes from either. But it comes from a man in history about the 19th century by the name of Friedrich Nietzsche. Perhaps you've heard this name before, or at least the German mispronounced, as they, most people call him Nietzsche. However, if you are reading the German properly, it's Nietzsche. Anyhow, Friedrich Nietzsche was a philosopher, German philosopher, in about the mid to late 19th century. And Friedrich Nietzsche was mainly known for being largely anti-Christian, even more so anti-religion. In fact, most people would go so far as to call him a nihilist. And if you don't know what a nihilist is, this is someone who believes there is absolutely no purpose, no goals in life. Well, we'll see how this ties in in just a minute. Well, Friedrich Nietzsche is probably known, though, for another phrase that he said. And that phrase is, God is dead. Now, I don't know if you've heard this phrase before, but hearing it now, probably a few of you, makes you uncomfortable, if not offends you. And I would say rightfully so. Now, when Nietzsche said this, he was suggesting that, from his nihilist background, no purpose, no goals, well then, that life should be free to do what you want, when you want. You can live your life how you want to. Doesn't sound at all familiar today, does it? Anyhow, Nietzsche said this phrase, God is dead. Very much in stark contrast, I think, to the words of our gospel lesson this morning. In fact, as you read our gospel lesson today, we have Jesus' own words when he says, Anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now Nietzsche's words, of course, puts everything on the individual, doesn't it? Whereas Jesus' words there speak a very clear truth. And that very clear truth is that we are to follow Jesus all the way. There is no halfway with following Jesus. We are either his disciple or we are not his disciple. Now I didn't think this, though, was the hardest word to read, the hardest words to read in our gospel lesson. I would suggest actually the verse that came right before this. Verse 26 was a little bit harder. And if you turn in your bulletins right now and look at the gospel lesson, you'll notice the second verse states, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoa. I don't know about you. That's a little hard to swallow. First of all, I don't often use that word hate. Typically, I'll use don't like, strongly dislike. But the word hate? And then when Jesus uses it, who is he saying to hate? Most of the time, we could say, okay, I can hate my enemies. I can hate those who are mean to me, those who pick on me or something like that. But to hate, to hate our families, to hate our fathers and mothers, our sisters, our brothers, our sons, our daughters, our grandchildren, to hate our lives. I don't know about you, but I love my family. I love my wife. I love my brothers and sisters. I love my grandparents. I love my parents. And I, most days, love living. So when I read this, it catches me off guard. Jesus saying, hate. Hate is such an ugly word, too. Perhaps if you're not used to things being called ugly like that, hate and ugly seem to go hand in hand. When I lived in Baton Rouge for a year, when you were being rude or speaking poorly against someone, 
we would call it ugly. So if you were talking behind someone's back or being insulting, it was called ugly. And very much hate captures that word. When we use that word hate, what do we usually use it with? When do we use that word hate? We talk about hate when we talk about racism. We talk about hate when we talk about religious groups fighting against one another. We talk about hate when we talk about someone who has harmed us beyond what we can imagine. But to talk about hating our families, to talk about hating our lives, many of us don't even allow that word in our house. And if it wasn't Jesus speaking, we probably would say this is a terrible example for our children, wouldn't we? So what did Jesus mean by this word, hate? He was very clear. It's the same word he uses when he says the world will hate him when they reject him. So what did he mean? Well, like with most scripture, we have to read the context of the verse. We have to read the context of this whole chapter, Luke 14. If you turn right before our gospel lesson today in Luke 14, you'll notice that Jesus uses a parable that most of us are familiar with. It's the parable of the wealthy landowner who was hosting the great banquet. And in case you don't remember it, just to refresh your memory for a moment, here this landowner was planning this wonderful banquet, here a parable of Jesus, and he invited all of his friends. He sent out his servants with the invitations. They went out, and of course everybody came, right? No, we know how the parable goes. The first guy says, well, I can't come because I have to tend to my new field I just bought. The second guy says, well, I can't come because I have to look after five new oxen I bought. The third guy says, well, you know, I can't come either. I just got married and there's no way I'm leaving my spouse. Well, perhaps you don't initially see the connection. But if you look at the meaning of this parable, you have these people who were invited. Here God is the rich landowner, and the people, well, they're God's people. Whether you're counting the religious people back in the day, or you're counting the religious people today. And they made excuses. They put other things before serving God. In fact, the way that they looked at it, they wanted nothing to do with what God was offering. Instead, God sent out his servants to fetch those who were lost, those who were on the highways and the byways to bring them to him. It's interesting because while you maybe still don't see the connection, perhaps what Jesus was talking about there is the way we put our families the way we put our lives sometimes before what God desires. The way that sometimes, instead of taking up our cross and following Christ, we put these other things first. And it's not bad to care for our families. It's not bad to take care of our lives. But when they take precedence over God, when they take the place of God in our lives, this is when they become a problem. And to clarify this a little more, Matthew says in chapter 10, well, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. See, it's not so much about hate. It's not so much that Jesus is saying that we should not take care of our families or our bodies. What he's getting at is where we place God in our lives. And where does God stand in your life? What position is he in your life? It's hard to think about, isn't it, sometimes? It's hard to think about when God is not the priority in our lives. 